الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض Brother Chairman, brothers and sisters here at the Research and Information Center in uh, Taman Tun, Dr. Ismail area of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Gog Magog or Ya'juj Ma'juj, <coughs> Russia and uh, the Zionist West. It's a tantalizing subject and uh, a subject of supreme importance at this particular time in history. It is therefore such a pity that we cannot get the scholars of Islam around the world to come to this subject. What a pity. We begin and we got some miles to travel tonight. <laughs> so you'll allow me to, tra- to cut some corners to be able to finish in time. <coughs> and please forgive the coughing. The pagan Arabs did not know how to respond to a claim from one who was born in their midst, who grew up amongst them, whose standard of conduct was so high that they gave him the name Al-Amin, the one who is trustworthy. And then when this man (coughs) reaches the age of 40, he informs them that he is a prophet of God like unto Moses and Abraham, alayhim salam. How do we deal with this? They sent a delegation to the city to the north at that time called Yathrib, now called Medina because there were Jews out there and the Jews have a long history of prophets. The rabbis responded and said, ask him these three questions which only a prophet can answer. Tonight we look at one of the three. (coughs) Ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the land. The two ends of the land. And the answer to the question came down in Surah Al-Kahf. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the answer by repeating the question. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ And they question thee about the Karnain. <coughs> Karnain means two Karns. And Karn can mean a horn. Or more appropriately for our context, Karn can mean an age or an epoch. And so for us, a man whose story is going to impact on two ages, one in the past and one which is to come. He travels in both directions, but then Allah goes beyond the two journeys to describe the third. The rabbis wanted to know whether he knew about the third. (laughs) And on that third journey, Zulkarnain came upon Gog and Magog. And these are, these are a people who constitute a major sign of Akhiru Zaman, or the last age. 
which only a prophet would know. <coughs> Gog and Magog have to be human beings. Why? Because they were described in the Quran with these words. بَعْدَوْزُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّ يَأْجُوجَ وَمَأْجُوجَ مُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ The Gog and Magog are people who commit fasad in the land. Fasad is conduct which is very sinful. To commit sin, you've got to have a free will to be held accountable. <laughs> so either jinn or human beings, not angels. Angels cannot commit sin. And of the two human beings or jinn, the Quran is clear, it's not jinn. So human beings. So let us begin by <laughs> taking all the fairy tales and put it in the garbage bin. Gog and Magog are human beings. We have not gone to hadiths yet. Notice that our analysis is based only on the Quran so far. <coughs> they are, however, a people who have been endowed with power indestructible power. How do we know that? Because Allah speaks in the Quran about Zulkarnain and says that he has given the power to do whatever he wishes to do. So Zulkarnain is a superpower. But when on the third journey <coughs> Zulkarnain was requested by people who were suffering from the facade, the corruption and destructive conduct of Gog and Magog. Please help us, we prepared to pay you. Zulfarnain could not destroy them. No. Rather, he had to be content to build a barrier which would contain them. So now they are contained. They can't do their wickedness anymore. So we know that Gog and Magog are very powerful evil forces, human beings. And we know about Zulkarnain that he also has power. He can punish. But Insofar as Gog and Magog is concerned, he can only contain them so that they cannot commit their facade. Only Allah can destroy Gog and Magog. So Dhulkardin's journey is described in the Quran, and the Quran begins with a journey to the setting of the sun. And as he journeys to the setting of the sun, he came upon a body of water which the Quran describes as Hamiya. Dark and murky. <coughs> when we use the totality of the data that we have, and I don't have the time to do that tonight, but I do have a book at the back entitled, oh my, I don't think I may have brought enough copies with me tonight, An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern World. Hmm? Then we can easily recognize the body of water. And indeed in the books of Tafsir you'll find that the Mufassirun have recognized it and identified it as the Black Sea. And guess what is located in the Black Sea? A peninsula called 
Crimea. Oh yes, Crimea is in the Black Sea. So <coughs> when he reached to the Black Sea, Ainun Hamia, he found the people living there, and Allah asks him, Inna an Inna an tu'adziba wa inna an tattakhitha fihim husna. Zulkarnain has power. But his power rests on the foundations of faith in Allah. And notice that Russia is returning to faith. Returning to Christianity. Russia told them, get lost. We are not going to enact any legislation allowing a man to marry another man. Get lost. Russia will not do that. Russia slapped them on their face and it's still stinging them up to now. Who? Oh, the Zionist West which today is now flowering and blossoming into what its true essence is. That in the Zionist West, the last symbol of progress is legislation that will allow a man to marry another man. <coughs> so Zulkarnain has power. And his power rests on the foundations of faith. How are you going to treat these people? Listen carefully, because this has application, not only at that time, but in a time to come, which would be in Akhiru Zaman, because Gog and Magog belong to Akhiru Zaman. Inna an tu'adziba wa imma you can either punish or reward. How are you going to use your power? <coughs> Zulkan Nain replies, and these are his words, and they better listen carefully out there in Washington. Listen carefully to the Quran. أَمَّا مَنْ ظَلَمَ فَسَوْفَ نُعَذِّبُهُ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّ إِلَى رَبِّهِ فَيُعَذِّبُهُ أَذَابًا نُخْرًا If you are wicked in your country, if you use your armed forces against your own people, the armed forces against your own people, <laughs> that's wickedness. So Ukraine, you better listen. If you are wicked in your conduct, then I am going to punish you. And when I am finished with punishing you, you will then return to your Lord and He will punish you as well. And so when power rests on the foundations of faith, there will be harmony between the world here and the, and the world above. Woman, وَأَمَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُ جَزَاءً الْحُسْنَةً وَسَنَكُولُ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِنَا يُسْرًا For those who are a people of faith, says Zulkarnain, and whose conduct is righteous, I will reward them. I'll treat them nicely. So this is, this is a power which uses power for purposes of justice and for purposes of furthering the cause of truth and of righteous conduct. Masha Allah. And then Zulkarnain traveled in the direction of the rising of the sun. And there he came across a people, لَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُمْ 
Minduniha Sitra. Sometime, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be agonizingly brief in his use of language. Agonizingly brief. Why couldn't he just expand it a little bit more? All that Allah tells us about the people that he encounters on the journey towards the rising of the sun. Lam naja'allahum min duniha sitra. That's all we have to work with. That's all. We come to the conclusion, and it's difficult to conclude, that maybe this is a lesson in human rights. Human rights. The Zulkarnain places human rights above all other considerations. That if you come across a primitive people, and in that land in which they live, there is an ocean of oil underneath. <laughs> in order to access that oil, you've got to get rid of these people. No. That's what the oil companies would do. That's what the Zionist West would do. Without batting an eye, they'll get rid of the people. Because money is more important than people. The oil is more important than the primitive people. But not Zulkar name. So Ukraine, I hope you're listening. <laughs> because Zulkar name places the human person and the rights of the human person above all other things. And these were a primitive people. Kazarik. One word? That's all you've given us, Allah. One word? Kazalik. وَقَدْ أَخَطْنَ بِمَا لَدَيْهِ خُبْرَ One word. See how difficult it is sometimes with the Qur'an? <laughs> we understood perfectly why he acted in the way that he did. He left them as they were. Kazalik. He did not disturb them. So be careful with Zulkarnain. Be careful because Zulkarnain places human rights at the top of the list. And if you violate the human rights of a single person, he will come after you. We said that the, the rabbis ask of only two journeys. But that was a trick. They wanted to know whether he knew about the third journey. And on the third journey, we are taken to Gog and Magog. These are a people who impact upon Akhiru Zaman. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam came upon some of his companions who were sitting talking amongst themselves and he asked what are you talking about and they said we're talking about the subject of akhir zaman alamat the signs of the last day and then he said in a very famous hadith the last hour will not come until and he mentioned ten the ten signs have not been given in the chronological order in which they will occur. No. So when we give them to you, they are random. They are known as the ten major signs. Number one, Dajjal, al masihud Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. Number four, Dukhan, smoke. Number five, Dabbatul Ab. 
beast or a creature of the land. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. And unfortunately, I am not going to offer any opinion anymore on that one. It just cost me too much time. <laughs> so I'm going to leave the sun where it is. Number six, that the sun will rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine, three earthquakes. Three earthquakes in which the earth would sink down. Therefore, a chas and the plural chusuf. And the earth will swallow what it swallows. One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia. And number ten, that the fire will come out of Yemen, drive people to their place of assembly for judgment. <coughs> and so Gog and Magog are supreme actors in the world. In Akhiru Zaman. And they are a powerful force. And they use their power to oppress. They use their power wickedly. They use their power to corrupt and to destroy. Can we identify them? There is one more reference in the Quran, only one more, to Gog and Magog. The first one we've already introduced you to is Surah al -Kaf. So now leave, let's leave Surah al -Kaf and go to Surah al -Anbiya. <coughs> Last night we spoke about methodology for dealing with the ayat of the Qur'an on Akhiru Zaman that more often than not it is not tafsir no it is not tafsir tafsir is explanation but these ayat are not to be explained rather they have to be subjected to ta'wil which is interpretation and that's not easy. And in the Quran, in Surah Al Kaf, we were told that in order for you to interpret, to subject something to ta'wil, you need more than the rational faculty. For when Musa alayhi salam encountered the true scholar of Akhir al Zaman, Khidr alayhi salam. Three events are described. And on all three occasions, Musa gave tafsir. And he was wrong. <laughs> and Khidr alayhi salam gave ta'wil. He was right. But he could give ta'wil not because he did not have only the rational faculty. Something else beside that. وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ <coughs> مِنْ لَدُنَّ عِلْمًا Knowledge which comes directly like a river flowing from above. And so this is a man with nur. And with nur he has internal intuitive spiritual insight and that's why he's able to provide ta'wil or interpretation of ayat in the Quran pertaining to akhir zaman <coughs> in surah al-anbiya Allah speaks about a town The people of the town have been punished. The town has been destroyed. 
the people have been expelled from that town. And having expelled them and destroyed the town, Allah then placed a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim this town as their own. No, sir, you can come back as a tourist, but you can never come back to reclaim this town as your own. Tafsir is inadequate to identify the town. Ta'wil is something that the Mufassirun are not comfortable with. So the Mufassirun confine themselves, and wisely so, to Tafsir. And when the time comes for a verse of the Qur'an to be penetrated and for the ta'wil to be delivered, the interpretation, then Allah will send the knowledge and it will be interpreted. Which town is it? <coughs> There's a ban. You cannot return to reclaim this town as your own. Hatta Ida Futi Hatya Juju Wama Juj until Gog and Magog have been released. Wahum in Kulli Hadabin Yan Sirun and with their indestructible power. They spread out all over the world in the world order of Gog and Magog. Then the world will witness these people being brought back to that town. Today, Ta'wil is possible. It was not possible for the last 1,000 years. Today we can recognize the town as Jerusalem easily. That Allah destroyed Jerusalem and He expelled Banu Israel because of their facade. لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ كَبِيرًا says Allah because of the facade which they committed in the Holy Land Allah threw them out and then placed a ban on them that they could never return indeed he did more than that he broke them up into bits and pieces and scatter them all over the world. So Jews in China and Jews in Argentina and Jews in Russia who knows maybe in Malaysia as well. <laughs> Excuse me. وَقَطَعَنَاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أُمَمْ Hot water. <laughs> So when you see Banu Israel being brought back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own, then you as a student of the Quran, you know that those who have brought them back are Gog and Magog. So now how do we identify Gog and Magog? Does the Qur'an help us? We know it's people in modern Western civilization, yes. But can we be more precise? Who are they in modern Western civilization? I mean, Jimmy Carter, a decent man. <laughs> President of the United States. So Jimmy Carter also part of Gog and Magog. <coughs> Excuse me. Last night at Masjid Ubudiyah in Shalam, 
we took you to the most important verse in the Quran, <coughs> explaining the reality of the world today. And we use the methodology for giving that explanation. There is a schoolboy methodology in which you take a verse of the Quran in isolation to arrive at meaning. But we are not schoolboys. The proper way is to take the totality of the data in the Quran bring it together into a harmonious whole in order to be able to derive meaning from a verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a command in Surah Al-Ma'idah. You have heard it many times in the past. Please listen to it one more time. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who have faith in Allah, La tattakhidul yahuda wa nasara awliya. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Do the governments read the Quran ever? <laughs> is Allah speaking about all Jews? And is he speaking about all Christians? Not possible. No. Because even a cursory examination of the rest of the Qur'an makes it impossible. Well then, if Allah is not speaking about all Jews and all Christians, which Jews and which Christians is he speaking about? The answer is right there in the words which follow. Do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians who ba'aduhum awliya uba ba'aduhum awliya uba who are themselves friends and allies of each other. In other words, the Quran is warning of a time to come when a mysterious reconciliation will take place between these two foes, these two enemies of each other. And some of the Christian world and some of the Jewish world are going to forge friendship and alliance. When that happens, do not take them as your friends and allies. The command is a powerful command because of the words which follow. <coughs> Whosoever from amongst you <laughs> declaring La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah hmm? but you take them as your friends and allies. You've lost your Islam. You now belong to them. And when you go down in the grave, you've got a surprise coming there for you. Inna Allah la yahdil qawm al-zalimin. Surely Allah did not provide guidance for a wicked people. Hmm? And so now we know those who brought them, Banu Israel, back to the Holy Land, belong to modern Western civilization. But within modern Western civilization, there is a Judeo-Christian alliance. What is it that binds them together? Answer, on this side there are Zionist Christians, and on that side there are Zionist Jews. And so it is a Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance which have brought back Banu Israel to the Holy Land. Oh, oh, wait a minute. So that means that the European Jews, they don't, they don't form a part of Banu Israel. Did you hear that? 
<laughs> the European Jews are fly-by-night Jews. <laughs> they don't have any genetic links with Abraham, Ibrahim salam. No, not at all. They are Jews who have accepted Judaism, converted to Judaism, accepted Judaism, but not through descent. No, they are not Banu Israel. And so now we can identify Gog and Magog. It took me a little time. But Gog and Magog is the Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance which has NATO, NATO in French, L'OTAN, NATO as its military arm. It is this alliance which defeated the Muslims and liberated the Holy Land for the Jews. 1970. It is this alliance which brought the Banu Israel back to the Holy Land. It is this alliance which brought the state of Israel into being. It is this alliance which has protected Israel with countless vetoes in the Security Council of the United Nations. Until Israel has grown and grown and grown to become a superpower. It is this alliance which wants Israel to rule the world. And that's why they now say that our goal that we are pursuing is full spectrum dominance over all of mankind. Full spectrum dominance over all of mankind. Why do they want Israel to rule the world? Secular scholarship can't answer that question. No. <laughs> Secular scholarship, as nice as it sounds, does not have the capacity and the scope to answer this question. Secular scholarship would never say Israel wants to rule the world because that's beyond the capacity of their scholarship. Only Islamic eschatology can say Israel wants to rule the world. Why does Israel want to rule the world? So that tomorrow a man will emerge in Israel. <coughs> Prophet Muhammad Islam described that man to us 1400 years ago. And that man will declare in Jerusalem, I am Al-Masih. But he would not be the son of Mary. No. He would be Al-Masih Dajjal. Who teaches the subject of Dajjal today? The subject of Dajjal is weeping, 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 because there's nobody, nobody to teach it. Nobody. That's why we're building an institute of Islamic eschatology based here in Malaysia but also with campuses elsewhere. And in that institute of Islamic eschatology we'll make a humble effort to start teaching so that tomorrow we'll have scholars inshallah. Now that we have identified Gog and Magog, the people who want to rule the world. It doesn't matter what price they have to pay. It doesn't matter if they have to provoke world war. It doesn't matter if they have to provoke nuclear war. It doesn't matter to them even if the whole world has to be destroyed. It does not matter to these people. They don't care. They have a... They have a... Pig-headed obsession. Messianic from the word Messiah. That we have to rule the world. Sometimes I wonder whether they're human beings. 
Did they actually have a mother who has the milk of human kindness within her? Did you ever have a mother after you killing all those people in Afghanistan and killing all these people in Pakistan and you tell monstrous lies and then Air Force One lands in KL <laughs> and everybody wants to come and welcome you. You're the biggest liar in the world and you have no shame when you tell lies. You want to force the submission of all of mankind to you. Well, they've all submitted already. All our rulers, <laughs> the Muslim world, they've all submitted. They're all shoeshine boys of Washington. The president of the club seems to be the prime minister of Pakistan. But would you be able to force the submission of room? Who is room? Be careful, because room is in the Quran. There's a whole surah of the Quran entitled Surah to Room. And if you are honest, something which seems to be in short supply amongst my critics, if you are honest, it's easy to recognize room. You do not begin your study of room with the hadith. No, that's wrong methodology. If you want to identify room, you have to begin with the Quran. We don't have the time tonight <coughs> to, be, uh, to give you all the details. But in Surah to Room, Allah uses the word room. The word room, <coughs> excuse me, is used in the Quran only once. In the whole Quran only once. So you can't miss it. Now, Alif Lam Mim. Ghulibati Rum. Rum has been defeated. Fi Adnal Ark. In the land close by. When was this? 1400 years ago when the Quran was revealed. Was there any Washington at that time? <laughs> was there any Western Alliance at that time? <coughs> Don't they have any sense? Where has wisdom and knowledge gone? Identifying room in this frivolous way. <laughs> That room is the Western Alliance. Fi adnal ard. Room has def been defeated in a land close by. There was no American force at that time. Wa hum min ba'di ghalabihim sayaglibun. But within a few years they're going to turn the tables and room is going to be victorious. In just a few years. In just a few years. And so said, so done. Everybody at that time knew who was Rome. Rome was the Christian Byzantine Empire of Orthodox Christianity. That Christianity which says, no sir, we are not going to allow a man to marry another man. The other Christianity wants the whole world <laughs> to enact legislation. The Vatican is there also to allow a man to marry another man. But this Christianity says, no, don't believe me, go check it out. Lillahi <laughs> al-amr. Min qabl wa min ba'd. The victory of Rome at that time was in consequence of a decision taken by Allah. Security Council of the United Nations cannot intervene 
when Allah decides. But there are two victories, two, not one. Lillahi al-amr min qabl wa min ba'd. The previous victory, Allah decided. And the subsequent victory, which is to come, Allah decides. When will that subsequent victory come? For whom? It hasn't come. Because Constantinople disappeared. And Rome disappeared. <laughs> Thanks to the Ottomans. And Rome now move to Moscow. It is rather silly to send me an email telling me, Oh, no, 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 there's a patriarch in Constantinople, in Istanbul. So Rome is still there. Shake him around. It's rather silly, isn't it? Because Rome in the Quran is a power which can wage war. <laughs> can the patriarch in Constantinople who lives under the heel of the Turkish government, <laughs> can he wage war? Where have their sense gone? Huh? When, the, when you ask the people of Rome, who leads you today? It's Russia. It's Moscow. So I want to suggest to you, don't bother with these snipers. They're just wasting our time. It is clear to us that Rome today is Moscow, is Russia. <coughs> and that there are two victories. لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرَ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ بَعْلُ وَيَوْمَئِذٍ Excuse me. <coughs> وَيَوْمَئِذٍ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And on the day of victory, Rome's victory, we the Muslims are going to be celebrating. Thank you. We the Muslims are going to be celebrating. It's been a long time since last we celebrated. Huh? With all these shoe shine boys that we have as leaders. <laughs> it's been a long time. And that's why last night I offered an analysis which allow us to smile. That when Allah spoke about Zul Karnain, Someone who impacts upon two ages, Karn and Karn. And the second Karn has to be Akhiru Zaman because of Gagan Magar. I said last night that the second Zul Karnain is Vladimir Putin. Remember the rules that when Imran Hussein offers an opinion, you must never accept it unless and until you are convinced that I am correct. That is the respect I have for your intellect. I never say to you, don't listen to that fellow. No. I say, listen to him, listen to me. But you. <coughs> You must use your rational faculty, your independent thinking and your research to take your decision as to whether or not this is truth. Because you will have to answer before Allah. So I am suggesting to you tonight that we have a confrontation emerging before us now. And this confrontation is anticipated in Surah al -Kaf. In two Karns, Karnain. The first one was at that time when the barrier was built out there in the Caucasus Mountains. And the second one is this. If I am right, that Vladimir Putin is the Zul Karnain of this age, <coughs> the implication is that Russia will show absolutely no fear. Absolutely no fear whatsoever. 
in the use of power. That if the Ukrainian government of shoeshine boys of Washington, I'm sorry to use this language, I know the Ukrainian ambassador is not going to be happy with it. <laughs> I know that Ukrainian citizens who listen to me would not be happy with this. But I want to say to you, that those who came out of the barricades in Maidan, Maidan in Arabic is a square. They use the same Maidan out there in Kiev and Ukraine. And they brought down the, the legally elected government of Ukraine. They brought it down with their rioting and their sniping and so on. So this government of shoeshine boys of Washington, if they make the mistake of launching an armed attack on the people of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, who oppose them and don't recognize them. Then that will constitute wicked conduct. That will be a violation of human rights because you don't have the legal authority. You came out on the streets to wit to, to overthrow a legally elected government. So you don't have the right and the authority to use the army against us. We don't recognize you as government, no. The day that they use force, send the army to attack the people of Eastern Ukraine, and Eastern Ukrainian people begin to die, the Zulkarnain of this age is going to respond. As Allah said in the Quran, Zulkarnain is going to give you a beating of your life. And when he is finished with you and you go to the Lord, the Lord is going to give you another beating of your life. If I'm right, then we're going to be celebrating tomorrow. If I'm right, then we are going to be celebrating tomorrow. Because Rome is not going to back down. Can Rome destroy Gog and Magog, the Zionist NATO alliance? No. <coughs> but then what can Rome do with them? Rome can contain them. I don't know, using military strategy, what would be the method of containing, of containing them. I don't know. That's beyond my scholarship. <coughs> what remains now is the rest of the story. The Prophet والسلام, just give me a few more minutes, the Prophet ﷺ gave us a timeline of events. And I'm fond of quoting this hadith, which is in the Sunnah of Abi Dawood. He said, Umran ubayt al maqdis falabu yatrib. You should try to memorize it. When Jerusalem is flourishing, built up, center stage, as it is today, Arabu Yathrib. Yathrib or Medina will be in a state of forlorn desolation. Occupying no status whatsoever in the world. Occupying no status whatsoever in the Muslim world. Occupying no status whatsoever even in Arabia. It's just a town to go for pilgrimage to the masjid to the grave of the Prophet Nothing else in Medina. That's where it is today. Kharabu Yatrib, Khurujul Malhama. When Jerusalem is flourishing, and Yatrib or Medina is where it is today, then the next event which will occur is the Malhama. That's the Great War that the Christians call Armageddon. Secular scholarship is silent on the subject. It is only Islamic eschatology 
or ilm akhir or zaman, which can say to you, this is where we are now. Now the next major event in akhir or zaman is going to be the big war. We should make the First World War and the Second World War look like a fight over peanuts. <laughs> the Prophet said about the Malhamah, it's going to be such a great war that birds flying in the sky will fall down. My opinion is that the birds will not be able to fly because they can't navigate. My opinion is they will not be able to navigate because of the corruption of the atmosphere with all the radiation that comes from nuclear weapons exploding. Nothing electronic will work after that. So no aeroplanes in the sky, no fighter aircrafts, no cruise missiles, nothing of that sort can operate. <coughs> Gog and Magog cannot be destroyed, they can only be contained. So after the Malhama, what? It's going to happen. Notice that the hadith goes on to say, Khurujul Malhama Fathul Constantinia. I pronounce it as Constantinia, but in Arabic they pronounce it as Constantinia. Kos, not Kod. Constantinia is closer to the original. But <coughs> in Arabic they say, Constantinia. <coughs> Why would the conquest of Constantinople be so important immediately after the Malhama? Why? The Prophet ﷺ prophesied it. لَتَفْتَحَنَّ الْكُنْسْتَنْتِنِيَ You will most certainly conquer Constantinople. And what a wonderful commander that will be of that army. And what a wonderful army that's going to be. He, he commended them, praised them. We have disposed of this foolish <laughs> claim that the conquest of Constantinople in 1453 by a man named Sultan Muhammad Fatih was the fulfillment of the prophecy. We've thrown that in the garbage bin. We don't need to waste time with that anymore. The conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Nabi Muhammad comes after the Malhama. The Malhama has not has yet taken place. So you could take 1453 and throw it into the garbage bin. What's the importance of the conquest of Constantinople after the Malhama? Answer, we have no more aerial warfare after the Malhama. Warfare can only be on the land and the sea. If Rome is to continue as a fighting force, the major military contribution that Rome can make is naval. There's going to be an alliance with Rome in Akhir Zaman, Muslim alliance with Rome. That's there in the Hadith. <coughs> so the land battle will be fought by Muslims and the naval battle will be fought by Rome. And Rome cannot wage the naval battle unless Rome controls Crimea. That's why the Soviet Union, which was a Zionist stooge, the Soviet Union gave away Crimea, which was Russian territory, to Ukraine in 1954 to stab Russia in the back to stab room in the back. And then they use their color revolutions to dismantle the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Why? So that among other things, Ukraine can emerge as an independent state. 
And when Ukraine emerges as an independent state, then you've got to bide your time until you can put a government there in Kiev, which would be pro-West. Well, they couldn't get any elections. They got two demonstrations. And the elected government was overthrown. And they got a government of shoeshine boys of Washington. The next step was for Ukraine to apply for membership in NATO. And once Ukraine is accepted as a member of NATO, then NATO can now in install nuclear weapons in Ukraine. And when that is in place, then Ukraine will pick a quarrel with Russia and then say to Russia, get out of Crimea. And so the Russian naval port, which is the port for the Black Sea, will be lost. And that will be the end of Russia as a threat to Israel. That was the master plan. But they planned their plans. And Allah plans his plans. And what happened two, three weeks ago, when Vladimir Putin, within a matter of two weeks, turned the tables on them, was a sign from above for those who read the signs from above. And today Crimea is Russian territory. So Russia is now more powerful than it has been for the last hundred years, since 1917. And so now we can understand that Crimea has a critical role to play in the conquest of Constantinople. When Constantinople is conquered, that's the end of NATO. Gog and Magog will lose their control over the Bosphorus. And so the Russian Navy can enter into the Mediterranean Sea. And that is bad news for Israel. This has been our talk on Gog, Magog, Russia, and the Zionist West. There is so much more I could have spoken about. I could have taken another one or two hours with you. And it would have been very interesting for you. Oh yes, you would have loved it. If I had taken you from 1917 with Soviet history mm -hmm. and taken you step by step to show you what the plan was. But we don't have the time for that. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may fill the longings of your heart for knowledge of the reality of the world in which we live today. That the Qur'an may be the means through which you might understand that reality. If you love the Qur'an, the Qur'an will love you. If you recite the Qur'an, if your tears fall on the pages of the Qur'an, one day, one day, it will happen. And Allah will give you the nur. And you'll be able to understand in the Qur'an what otherwise cannot be understood. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tuba alina ya mulana inna ka anta tawab rahim wa rahmatika ya arhma rahimin. I spoke for one hour. Not bad. We have now some time for questions or for comments.